Most of us get started with DBT working with that open source command line version of the tool, but they also offer a cloud hosted environment where you can connect and do all of the same things, but without the hassle of setting up your own infrastructure. So in today's video, I wanna walk you through how to get started with DBT cloud, how to use it to build your project and run commands, and then finally take a look at a variety of the other features that are on there that can make your life a lot easier as a DBT developer. And what I will say is that this isn't going to be a full-on DBT training style tutorial. There is an expectation that you have general understanding of the tool, but if you're new to DBT Cloud and wanna see what it's all about, then this video is for you. So let's dive in. Here I am on the DBT website, and what we're gonna do is create a free account. And for DBT Cloud, you will get it free forever for one developer, which is really great because there's a lot of features built into DBT Cloud that will make your life a lot easier. So I'll go through and fill this out and then we'll create the account. Next, it'll just ask you to verify our email. And just like that, we're ready to set up our DBT Cloud project. First thing they do here is by default, give you a project name analytics. And you can change this. You can click on this and change this to whatever you want, but I'll just leave it as analytics. Next, we want to choose a warehouse. And the warehouse is essentially your data warehouse. For me, I'm going to do Snowflake. And once you click next, it's going to bring you through the setup for your environment. So I'll go through and set this up for Snowflake. If you've worked with DBT CLI, the command line, this is the equivalent of setting up your profiles.yaml and setting your credentials. Moving along here, we have development credentials, and this is going to be your personal development credentials. So uh, in our case here for Snowflake, you're either gonna have a username and password or a key pair. So I'll put in my Snowflake username and password. And the schema here by default does the DBT underscore your first initial last name. And that is a pretty standard DBT convention. And the reason that they do that is so that you're not overriding other developers as you develop. So if you all did one shared dev schema, for example, as you use DBT, different developers are going to be constantly overriding each other's changes. But by putting it in your own schema, you'll have different areas for each developer to work on. And the target name is default in this case. So you could change this if you really wanted, but I think it's easy to just keep it as it is. Threads are how many parallel runs you want to have. Let's just go through and test this connection and this now pass. And one thing I did have to change is the account. You just need this for Snowflake. You don't need the HTTPS and other stuff. So that's what you need and we're good to go. Next. The next step is to set up a repository and this is where all of our code is going to live. And in my case, I'm working with GitHub. So I'm going to connect this directly with GitHub. Then right when I click that behind the scenes, because I'm already logged in over here, it connected to my GitHub and set up that connection. So if I were to go into settings and applications, I can see DBT Cloud is set up here. And now I can select a repository to use for this. So for me, what I did is I created a blank repo. There's not even a readme and just called a DBT Cloud demo that we can use for this scenario. And even though it's empty now, we're going to use DBT Cloud to initiate the skeleton of DBT and eventually get it up there. So, all right, it says your project is ready. We can start developing or you can do other stuff. For this, let's just start developing in the IDE. And they do have a new version coming out at the time of this video. So by the time you're watching this, it could look a little different, but I think the concepts will be similar. So we're gonna let this load up. And here's what it looks like. There's an editor in the middle. But before we get into any of this other stuff, let's initialize our project. So we can see it has this empty repo here. It's on the main branch. Now let's click initialize your project. And this is gonna give the skeleton version right away of dbt we'll go through and change this a little bit later but now that our basic skeleton is here let's commit this to github and just push it up so the commit message will say initial dbt layout and if we go back here and refresh we can see it immediately committed and pushed it because we were on the main branch right to github and so here it is and we now have this set up and just like that we're ready to use dbt cloud just to prove that this works, what we're going to do is down here, you can run commands. This is the, the equivalent of a terminal. So we'll just do a dbt run. And here we can see it's running the just few example models in here. And it worked. And that's because if we look at this, we can see it connected to target default, which is what we just set up before. And we can see it's building this table in my schema with the name of the model, which is based on the name of the file. And if we go into Snowflake now, if I were to refresh this, I have a DBT MCON schema in here now with the different tables and views from DBT. So that all worked as we expected. So one of the big things about DBT is the fact that you work with GitHub and you have different branches and everyone's kind of working together. What would that look like in DBT Cloud? So let's go through that workflow. First things first, from the main branch, you don't typically want to build right on that. So we want to create new branch. And because this is integrated, this is all going to work together. 
So I'll create a new branch, MK demo changes and submit. And what that's going to do is create a new branch and check out that branch. So now we're working on this and not the main branch. So let's say we want to make a subtle change. I don't know. Let's say change the name of the project to analytics and change this down here. And now we want to run it just to make sure that this still works and that didn't break anything. So now I'll commit the change, change project name, commit. But this time it's not going to go right here and we can see there's two branches when I refresh and that's because it automatically picked up MK demo changes, which is what I just did. And we can see it picked up that latest commit and what we can do directly through DBT cloud is open pull requests. So if you click this, it's going to take you right to a link in GitHub and allow you to see the changes and create pull requests. Typically you'd want to put information in here and obviously give you some more details, but I'm just going to skip that for the sake of this just merge it. And now if we go back to DBT cloud, what we want to do is check out a branch. So you do have two options. You can refresh the Git state if for some reason something got out of sync, but we want to check out a branch. And in our case, we want to check out the main branch and pull this new change because now that we merged it, we want DBT cloud to get it. And you can see this bright orange button here, pull changes from remote and now it's updated. And now from here, we would create a new branch again and go through that whole process over and over and continuously build out your project. Let's go through some of the other things that we got here. If we go to my first model, what we can see down here, it gives you a lineage of what's going on, which is really nice. If you click this compiled button, it's going to take what we have here and turn it into actual SQL. So if you had some refs, so I think this is probably a better example here, this second DBT model, if you do compile here, it will change the ref to the actual fully qualified name. So you can see it right away. And this is something you can copy and paste into Snowflake or whatever warehouse provider you're using. Query results, you can preview this right from here and it will give you the results down here. And I think it's going to limit it to 500 or something like that. So develop is going to bring you to this page, this editor in here where you can do all sorts of stuff and create your project. Next is deploy. So you can look at your run history once you create jobs. So you can run your DBT commands on a schedule directly from DBT cloud. Environments is where you can create your production, your QA, other different environments that you want to work with, just like you would on DBT CLI, but in the cloud, you can set it up through an interface. And then data sources, we're not going to get into in this video, but this will allows you to identify different sources and you can do things like source freshness to keep an eye on them and make sure everything's up to date. Now, documentation is going to be where you would have your docs. So you could host your DBT docs directly on DBT cloud, but you just have to enable some things and generate it for it to work. Now up here on the right, you have your breakdown of your account and projects. You can create multiple accounts. You can have multiple projects and it'll all list for you here. And over here is our settings. So within settings, we have our own profile information. You can see the linked information, your credentials. So if, again, if you have multiple projects in here, you can link to the different projects. And if you need to edit something, you can just quickly come in here and edit your credentials. You also have an API key if you ever need to use that. And these are things as you go along, as your project builds, you'll find a need for it, uh, you know, notifications, all sorts of stuff. Let's now take a look at these other deploy options. So let's start with an environment first. So on DBT cloud, there are two types of environments. You have development and you have deployment. There can only be one development environment. And that's what we set up before. And it's just your local environment. So each user is going to have their own development environment per project, only one. And what we want to do is create a deployment environment. So something that we can run on a job, you can't deploy to a development development environment through a job. So that's why you need a deployment environment. It forces you to separate those concepts. So what's the name of this? We'll call this, let's just say production deployment. Like it says, it already has a development, so we can't add another one. So this is automatically a deployment. You can select the version if you have something that you want. You can select to only run on a custom branch for production. Typically what you'd want to do is only run it on your main branch because that would represent the latest and greatest version of your project. So in our case, we only want to run production against main. Now connection, it's going to recognize what's in our account already and just kind of drop it in here. Instead of developer, I'm going to change this to account admin just because I'm lazy and I want to make sure we don't have any issues. So that's the deployment connection. You can override what's in the project like I just did. Now, deployment credentials is where you can change things. So for example, you're probably going to have a different user dedicated to production runs, like a service account or something. And this is where you can specify that information. For my sake, I actually am just going to keep the same thing because it's easy. So I'll put that information in here and schema is going to be if there's a default schema that you want to set for your deployment environment. This is going to depend on your project. So a lot of projects have custom schemas where they're actually overriding things anyway. So what you put here may not matter. But for me, I'll call this production 
just to be extra clear on what this is. And so this is again, kind of like creating another option in your profiles.yaml if you're used to the CLI. That's kind of what we're setting up here. Environments are the equivalent of creating a new object in that profile. All right, so let's save. Now there's no job. Let's create a job around this environment. Call this production run, what environment? Looks like I left this as new environment. I want to actually change this and I'll save this as production save because I want this environment to be called production. All right, so now let's create a new job. We'll call this production run, just the name of the job, what we're going to run on the schedule environment production, and we can set a default target in here. Again, think back to working with the CLI, giving it a target allows you to do a lot of custom things in DBT. This is how you're going to set what the target will be every time this job runs. So let's say we wanted it to be prod. If you had that target.name condition, this is where it would read that and determine whatever you're doing. Environment variables can be set in the environment setting. We're not going to talk about that in this video, but that is an option that you can add. You also have the option to defer if you wanted to do some stuff like slim CI, but we don't have anything set up here and we'll save that for another video as well as some of these other settings. But for now, instead of dbt build, because I think it's, it fails, I'm just going to do a dbt run. Keep that as is. Now down here, there's different triggers. So you can set up for your job to run on a schedule. So just directly in DBT Cloud, you can have it run every hour, every couple hours. You can have a custom cron schedule in here, whatever you want. We'll just keep this as manual, turn this off, but you know, typically you'd probably have a production run on a schedule. Webhooks, you can also have it on pull requests. What you can do is combine this with this defer setting up here to create a pretty cool kind of CI CD type of workflow within GitHub uh, if you run on pull requests. But again, we won't do that here. And we're not gonna touch with the API. So let's just create this job. It should just be a manual trigger has not run. So let's go and run now. So now we've kicked off a run from DBT cloud. Uh, you can see it's a manual one. If it was on a schedule, it would say something else here. And by clicking in here, you can see what's going on it's saying it's starting. We can reload here and get some updates. And down here we can see what it's doing, where it's at. It's cloning the repo. It got the profile and it's running this stuff here. It gives you a nice clean looking log and it was a success. And within here, you can also see the model timing. So if you have a bunch of models, you can visually see how long something took. It also stores your artifacts. So things like the different compiled sequels, the manifest, stuff like that. Now that we have this set up here, we can go back to run history and see our run history. And here it is. So as you have jobs running every hour or every day or manual, whatever, you can see that list of jobs here and easily go in and, and monitor it for yourself. So real quick, just to show you the documentation part, I'll do a dbt docs generate, which is going to generate our documentation. And it says your docs are ready to view and we can view it right from here. So if you click this link here, now we can see our project directly on dbt cloud and look at whatever we want, which is really nice, especially if you have a big project and you don't want to host it somewhere, you know, you can see it all right from here. You can build that into a job and have it automatically spin this out for you every time you have a new update to your project and get the latest docs on there as well. Hopefully now you can see the value that dbt cloud offers you as a developer but none of this really matters if you don't build your project correctly in the first place so check out this next video on some tips on how to properly build your dbt project